Let's talk about the Gothic. When it comes to the word Gothic, chances are you already have a very specific aesthetic in mind. Maybe something that looks like early 2000s punk bands and Hot Topic and even Roar Means I Love You and Dinosaur memes. Actually, I think that's emo. Regardless, there's a very set picture in your mind of what it means to be goth or gothic. And that idea or that aesthetic falls back probably a lot further than you think. Whether that picture in your head is influenced by current K-pop and J-pop groups or good old-fashioned Victorian horror films and TV shows, a lot of these borrow from one another, taking little pieces here and there from fashion and popular fiction and actually has very little to do with the original meaning of the word. Now, initially, the word Gothic was referring to a certain type of architecture that came from medieval Europe, which really was a misnomer, referring to the Visigoths, which were a certain group of barbaric Germanic people that had little or nothing to do with the architectural style that came to be sort of named after them. And really, by calling something gothic, people were making a judgment call on a style that they found to be barbaric and ancient and just, you know, no longer fashionable. And really has nothing to do with the sort of elevated, dark style and that, that like, fashionable aesthetic that we associate um, with the term today. What about gothic novels? Well, that's where Anne Radcliffe comes in. Anne Radcliffe was the gothic novelist, and as she wrote from the 1790s and into the early 19th century, she basically pioneered the genre, taking from this idea of this gothic architectural landscape and these old and what we would associate with being haunted spaces and placing young women and girls out of their domestic homes and out of their comfort and into these intimidating and threatening and mysterious places. If you were to have read Northanger Abbey during the time that it was originally written, chances are that you would have really understood and followed along with the kinds of references that Jane Austen or her character Catherine Morland makes, especially when it came to Anne Radcliffe novels. It's not surprising, however, whether you're reading it for school or for pleasure to kind of hit a sort of bump in the road while you're reading now and realize that you don't really understand the kinds of references that she makes. This really has a lot to do with whether or not your teacher puts it on the syllabus, whether or not you're willing to go out and find a book that, compared to Northanger Abbey, uh, looks... Um, more than twice the size and you know if whether or not that sounds like a good time to you there are certain kinds of references that I just might miss when it comes to understanding what exactly the gothic is and why it captivates Catherine Morland so much according to Maggie Kilgore in the rise of the gothic novel she states it seems easier to identify a gothic novel by its properties than by an essence that analysis of the form often devolves into a cataloging of stock characters and devices which are often recycled from one text to the next. Conventional settings. One castle, preferably in ruins. Some gloomy mountains, preferably the Alps. A haunted room that locks only on the outside. And characters. A passive and persecuted heroine. A sensitive and rather ineffectual hero. A dynamic and tyrannical villain an evil prioress, talkative servants. In other words, regardless of the novel itself, as long as it ticked these boxes, you could count on it being a gothic novel, or at least a Radcliffe novel. These stories focusing on these helpless young women, these cruel patriarchal figures, and these towering archaic spaces really struck a chord with her audience, an audience that was mostly made up of young women and one such young woman may have been Jane Austen. Now, Jane Austen was a young writer when she first wrote Northanger Abbey. Her first draft was finished when she was only 24 and was originally named after her original protagonist, Susan. 
When she sold it at that time in 1803, she was eager to see it published, but for reasons unknown, it was shelved. Six whole years went by before she wrote another letter urging for it to be published, but it wasn't for seven whole years after that until she finally gave up the ghost and just purchased her own manuscript back. Because at this point, 13 whole years after her initial endeavor, she had already published all of her most famous works, and they had sold relatively well, including Pride and Prejudice, Emma, Sense and Sensibility. These things had all been doing so well that she thought she would just revamp the original manuscript and try again. So after a furious revision during which she renamed it after her new protagonist, Catherine, Austin was eager to see it finally published around 1816. Unfortunately, it would be the following year that Austin would die. Northanger Abbey is one of two works that were published in conjunction with one another by her brother posthumously in 1817. During the time that it was originally written, Anne Radcliffe and the Gothic were at their height, which meant that these novels in this style had begun to become parodied, and Austen wasn't exactly an exception to this. Her first work focuses on the adventures of the young Catherine Morland and her obsession with the Gothic. If you've ever gotten really, really wrapped up in a good book or an excellent movie or TV series, then you might have a general idea as to how much of a fangirl and how, you know, immersed Catherine Morland got in these books and the gothic, especially if that book or show was scary. While over the top and dramatic in comparison to a subtle writer like Jane Austen, Anne Radcliffe was still considered uh, a fairly radical writer for her time especially considering the fact that women writers or even women readers were treated anywhere from being silly and, you know, childish to um, inappropriate and unacceptable. Now, what could be a more innocent or harmless pastime for a young girl than reading? The Mysteries of Adolfo is one of Anne Radcliffe's most famous books, which is why it's no surprise that that's the one that's mentioned when Catherine meets her new friend, Isabella in the city of Bath. In The Mysteries of Adolfo, the heroine within that narrative is forced to leave her own pastoral home and to go under the thumb of the cruel Montoni, a strange relative with perhaps unnatural desires towards her, and she's kept in this place they call Adolfo. For someone like Catherine, who was basically a homeschooled teenager surrounded by her own siblings and not much else, it's not exactly a surprise to think that she would find a novel like this really captivating and exciting. Terrible, yes, but thrilling too. So when she has an opportunity to have an adventure that happens outside of the pages of a book and to travel with family friends into the city of Bath, she leaps at it. However, she doesn't exactly leave the contents of that book entirely at home. The 2007 movie does a fairly good job at showing just how invested and influenced Catherine is by the novel she reads, and just how many times she begins to imagine herself as the heroine in any of those novels. In the beginning, we first see her reading and beginning to fantasize herself in the position of the gothic heroine there. I also don't use the word fantasize lightly. Uh, there definitely is a certain tone um, and perhaps uh, certain liberties that the movie takes with um, the kinds of uh, reading that they assume that Moreland is doing and uh, the kinds of enjoyment she is getting out of the books. Yeah, she's having a really good time. One of the first people that Catherine and her chaperone, Mrs. Allen, meet is the warm and friendly Mr. Tilney. Now, upon arriving in Bath, they find themselves at an event where they realize that they don't know any of the other guests there. That's awkward enough in 2019, but during the time in which it was written, and in the Regency period in general, if one didn't have someone to introduce them to others, they were kind of stuck. 
trapped by social convention. However, luckily for them, on their way out of said awkward party, they quite literally bump into Mr. Tilney, who kind of inserts himself in their conversation and subsequently into their lives. In the 2007 movie version, they add a cute little touch where he goes to find the Master of Ceremonies to um, come and properly introduce them before they've even exchanged names. Mrs. Allen, Miss Moore, delighted to make your acquaintance. Now after this, Catherine begins to go between this friend group and the Thorpes, who she meets soon after, and who John is depicted as having stared at her for most of the night at that event. And there's like a definite comparison between the two different friend groups, between the friend group of Henry and his family, who she gets to know, including uh, the polite and lovely Eleanor, and between Isabella and John, who are a lot more daring and risky in their adventures and who invite them to do things like go on open carriage rides through the street. How scandalous. Around this time, Catherine's brother comes to visit them, and he begins to get wrapped up in that circle as well, and sooner or later begins to court Isabella himself. As Isabella and Catherine really spark up a friendship, they become really excited about the prospect of becoming sisters through this as they already have so much in common, speaking about the gothic and the books that they love and the fashion and all the excitement that they hope to get not only from fiction, but, you know, while they're together in Bath. But as Catherine begins to know Henry and his family, there's a definite distinction and difference between the warmth and playfulness of his character and the cold and detached figure of his father. General Tilney. Now, if you were paying attention in class a little bit earlier when I was speaking about the sort of gothic tropes, it might be ringing a bell the idea of this patriarchal figure showing up and kind of looming like a dark cloud over their prey. Now, if we think that Catherine might be in a gothic novel, Catherine is more than aware of this too. And this certainly doesn't bode well for the missing Mrs. Tilney. Regardless, there are rumors or whispers of something that might have happened to Henry's mother and rumors of the place they call Northanger Abbey. Back to that Gothic architecture again. In order for a Gothic novel to really turn Gothic, the heroine has to be taken from somewhere that she finds comfort and stability and placed into somewhere cold dark and threatening. So when General Tilney approaches Catherine to invite her to come stay with them at the house in Northanger, Catherine is more than thrilled, even as she's aware of the potential steps this might be taking in her own gothic misadventure. As in a gothic novel, it doesn't really matter what the heroine does, the mysteries of the place will eventually find her. And Catherine is more than willing to embrace these mysteries herself. Now, Kilgore goes on to state that there's a, a fair difference between male and female Gothic, where these two traditions begin to kind of split off at a path. Now, whereas the male Gothic may be haunted by a certain kind of sexual sin or a certain kind of taboo, in the female Gothic, the private world is turned temporarily into a house of horrors. The domestic realm appears in a distorted nightmare formed in the image of the prison, the castle, in which men imprison helpless passive females, angels in the house, whose spirituality may be pushed to an extreme. The more you think about it, the idea of a young woman having to leave the home that she knows and enter into the household of a man who she does not know and become under his thumb and under his cold and potentially cruel rule at the own danger to herself and potentially others around her is really not that far of a stretch when you think of the kinds of fears that women might have had at that day. The idea of taking the home and taking the things closest to us and the things that, that are supposed to fall under duty and expectation where even if the woman does everything right, even if she's perfect, all these things can happen to her. 
well, it's not really a surprise to consider that this would be a major fear for many women of that time. But needless to say, when Catherine is invited to go stay with them at Northanger, she is more than a little excited, and for more than one reason. As they approach the home, it looks every bit the way that she had hoped it would look from the outside. And Henry is more than aware of that. Are you prepared to encounter all of its horrors? Horrors? There's no thing haunted then. Well, that's just the least of it. Dungeons and sliding panels, skeletons, strange unearthly cries in the night. And vampires? Don't say vampires. I could bear anything but not vampires. They go back and forth flirting like this for a while. Miss Morland, I do believe you're teasing me now. But upon further inspection on the inside, it's not exactly as intimidating or scary as some of the gothic mansions and castles that she's encountered in the pages of a book. In fact, she sort of kind of begins to realize maybe that she had begun to exaggerate or stretch what sort of things she might expect and knows that Tilney had been teasing her and kind of begins to put aside uh, the mystery and the ideas that she had hoped she would find in exchange for a nice time with her new friends. However, things look fairly different at night. Now, when it's time for bed, after you've been binge-watching the latest season of Stranger Things or consuming a huge batch of horror movies with your friends, chances are the moment you return home and enter the hall of your own apartment, things don't exactly seem the way that they did before. The shadows seem longer and the noises seem louder and you go to brush your teeth or to get a drink of water and you startle at your reflection and things are just amplified in a way. It seems like your own mind is trying to eat itself from within thanks to the steady diet of horror and suspense that's been filled recently. And Catherine, with her own absorption into the gothic novel she's been reading, um, is no exception to this sort of rule. And however, in spite of the storm that's begun to brew outside of her room, she has decided to be rational about all of this. She's not going to stoke the fire. She's going to let it die out as it does. She's ready to go to bed. She's not going to make a big deal about staying in a family friend's home. That's it. But then she sees the wardrobe. There's a wardrobe in her room that she had briefly noticed earlier that suddenly seems interesting and intriguing to her by candlelight. It's one that she describes as being of Japan, which just adds to the mystery and the exoticism. Needless to say, it's looming and interesting and she approaches it carefully as she begins to pull at it. Inside it, she finds a stack of papers, but just at that moment, lightning strikes. She feels a sudden need to get to her bed before anyone or anything can find out what she's done. But the next thing she knows, it's the morning. She wakes up hearing the sound of the maid who has come in to begin to help her get ready for the day and is beginning to tidy things up around the room. And she quickly grabs the papers before the maid can and like stores them away to look at them. And as she lifts them to her eyes, she realizes that what she's found is actually stockings and cravats. Entry lists. After she gets over her initial embarrassment and disappointment at realizing that her find isn't exactly a, a treasure or a mystery, um, she goes back down to hang out with the rest of the family. Henry Tilney has been sent back and forth on family business, so this morning she's invited to go along with Eleanor and the general on his morning walk. When they arrive at a certain part of the gardens, however, the general kind of hangs back and it leaves Eleanor and Catherine alone. During this time, Eleanor tells 
Catherine that this garden and this walk had actually belonged to her mother, who had passed when she was a child. Catherine immediately begins to find this highly suspect. The fact that the mother had died under what Eleanor tells her was sudden circumstances, and that the general himself is choosing not to enter like her favorite space tells her all she needs to know. How could they have loved one another? How could he have loved her if he's not willing to love her walk? As they talk to one another, Catherine begins to reckon that the next step in any good gothic novel would be for her to find some sort of likeness of the late Mrs. Tilney. Now, in a gothic novel, whether that's a, a portrait or a statue or even some um, dripping wax figure, this um, likeness is where the heroine often finds the next big clue of some kind. Eleanor tells her that actually there is a painting, a portrait that they had had commissioned of their mother. However, it is in a private room because the general doesn't like to look at it. Well, that sounds exactly like the sort of thing that Catherine would like to see. So when she asks to see it, Eleanor at first is like, I'm not sure, but quickly breaks and says, you know what, why not? Why shouldn't you see it? And as they go back to the house, they go in with every intention of going to see it but they're stopped by the general who tells them he doesn't want them exploring the house without him. And as Catherine goes on to realize, it's in a part of the house that is forbidden to her. So Catherine decides that the only way she's going to be able to do this without getting Eleanor in trouble with her is to explore these apartments alone. And she has a free hour, and when she's sure that the general is on his morning walk, and Henry is nowhere to be seen, she slips off into the apartments alone. But as she begins to explore, she begins to feel a sort of sinking feeling of embarrassment or shame because in the daytime, wandering about, it seems not like an abandoned and haunted space or a place where a woman had been kept until the end of her days, so much as just like a room that hasn't been occupied recently. It's nice, it's a little closed up and all, but it doesn't look spooky. But suddenly, around the corner comes not the general, but Henry. They both express their surprise at seeing one another. In the book, Henry seems a lot more generous in his assumptions as to why Catherine might be there, assuming that Eleanor had given her permission to be there, or that she had wanted to explore the rooms of the mother because she had heard such good things about her. But in the movie, and eventually within the novel itself, Catherine can't help but begin to allude to the theories and suspicions she's had about the death of his mother, or the cause, potentially, by his father. At first, Tilney uh, thinks that she's beginning to accuse his father of being negligent um, and insists that he and his older brother had been there when his mother had died and he had seen with his own eyes his father get different physicians and attendants and that they'd done everything that they could do to try to save his mother's life, but his mother had had an ongoing illness and this had just been the worst of it and that Eleanor really had been too young and hadn't actually even been around for most of it. But Catherine can't help but push. He begins to understand her meaning and says, If I understand you rightly, you have been suspecting my father of a crime so dreadful. You said yourself the house was full of secrets. And so you decided that my father must be a murderer. And Tilney says something more along the lines of, Perhaps after all, it is possible to read too many novels. That's where the movie and the book really split to me, where the clear moral lesson appears to be in the movie that, you know, if you read these novels, this is what's going to happen to you. You better not read them. It's going to corrupt your brain. Whereas in the 
in the book it doesn't seem quite quite that strong personally regardless at this point Catherine is humiliated and concerned that she's ruined everything but in the book they are able to um, have another meal together and at this meal Tilney does Catherine the favor of pretending like none of this has happened and more or less kind of smooths over things by ignoring the issue in general. But when Tilney gets called away on business again at some point, the general returns home from his own business and quite suddenly Catherine finds Eleanor coming up to her room um, in the middle of the night tell her that she has to leave now. She can't stay anymore. She's already embarrassed enough by the things she's done recently and she can only imagine what Henry must have told his father in order to make this happen. At this point things look really bad. It would be strange enough now compared to then that a young woman would be suddenly dismissed from a home without a chaperone and expected to get home. Luckily, they're not so cruel in that they make her find her own way. They send her along her way with some money so that she can take their carriage to another carriage and basically get home as safely as she can as a young woman traveling entirely by herself. Needless to say, this sort of drive of shame is a place for Catherine to really think about all that she's experienced and her own adventures and just the tragedy of the way that it's ended and knowing that Henry wasn't even there when she left and having no idea what he'll think of her once he gets back and and just being devastated. When she arrives home her family is pretty surprised at seeing her all of a sudden with no letter ahead or anything like that but they're happy to see her. Her mother and father don't truly understand just what it is Catherine's been through but to be fair, Catherine's not entirely sure herself. In the movie, they do a fairly good job at expressing the intimacy and friendship even that Catherine has with her mother and the rest of her family. They do a good job at showing how Catherine's mom has missed her and how she even comforts her understanding that Catherine's going through some form of heartbreak and embarrassment. That's actually fairly missing from the book where her mother's just like, aren't you over it? Like, half was like three days ago. Can you stop talking about it now? Can we move on? Can you help around the house? Actually, you should be doing some chores. Things of that nature to symbolize Catherine's just total dismissal of anything gothic or, or these novels that have corrupted her brain. In the movie, she burns her copy of The Mysteries of Adolfo. That does not happen in the books. Catherine is mortified about her own over-exaggeration and getting too swept up in the gothic and beginning to apply tropes and ideas to her own life and realizes that this has affected real-life relationships and that people don't necessarily fit so neatly into the little categories that she had begun to check off in her mind. This isn't to say, though, that the lesson is and now throw away all your novels, burn them. I think the real lesson is meant to be to understand that fiction is meant to be an escape from life, not an example of real life. People who read too many stories imagine all sorts of horrid things about ghosts and murders, and it is very wrong of them to do so, and it can get you into serious trouble. So let me not hear of any of you being so silly. One of the most famous passages in Northanger Abbey, related to this actually, comes much, much earlier, wherein Isabella and Catherine are just becoming friends before all the drama and the fallout. And they're speaking about novels. This is known as Jane Austen's defense of the novel. Yes, novels. For I will not adopt that ungenerous and impolitic custom so common with novel writers of demanding by their contemptuous censure the very performances to the number which they are themselves adding, joining with their greatest enemies and bestowing the harshest epithets on such works and scarcely ever permitting them to be read by their own heroine, who, if she accidentally take up a novel, is sure to turn over its insipid pages with disgust. <laughs> 
Alas, if the heroine of one novel be not patronized by the heroine of another, from whom can she expect protection and regard? I cannot approve of it. Let us leave it to the reviewers to abuse such effusions of fancy at their leisure, and over every new novel to talk in threadbare strains of the trash with which the press now groans. Let us not desert one another. We are an injured body. Although our productions have afforded more extensive and unaffected pleasure than those of any other literary corporation in the world, no species of composition has been so much decried. And then she goes on to continue to critique the critics a little bit herself. We're going to take that at its word, and I think it's a very powerful word. Austin is hardly going to decry novels as a whole in her own novel. Now before we end and you think, oh my gosh, that's it? That's so sad. Now she's to go home and that's it? Of course not. This is a Jane Austen novel. That's not, that's not it. Instead, of course, when her mother decides that her daughter has been moping about for too long, she's going to go get a book of her own kind, something that will be very moralizing and exciting for her daughter to read. But upon going upstairs to get it and coming back down, she realizes that another person has entered their home and that they have a guest. And that guest is Henry Tilney. After some awkward small talk and introductions, Tilney asks after the Allens, Catherine's chaperones in Bath, and Catherine's able to say that they've returned home safely and that they live just down the road. And using that as an excuse, the two um, slip out and go on that path towards the Allens' home where they can finally have a word alone. So as Catherine and Henry finally get this moment alone, she finally gets to understand exactly what it was that had her removed from that home so quickly. And as it turns out... He thought I was rich. It was Thorpe who misled him at first. Thorpe who hoped to marry you himself. And because of this, the general had invited her under the pretense of friendship, when in reality he had been hoping that one of his sons could inherit um, such a dowry. And once he had realized some time later that this was not the case, he was so infuriated he had her removed. But only guilty of not being as rich as you were supposed to be. For that, he turned you out of the house. He's finally realized to the extent that his father actually was like the villain in a gothic novel. Maybe he wasn't a murderer, but he certainly had made life easy on his mother and certainly didn't make life easy on anyone around him. And so even though his father had said, um, you are not allowed to leave, you cannot go after her, Tilney chooses to do so anyway. And when he proposes to her, he does so under the stipulation that they probably won't have very much money because he's probably disinherited at this point. But Catherine chooses him, even though she knows that choosing him means that she's not choosing Northanger. She's not choosing this exciting, exotic life so much as she's choosing a life with the man that she's grown to love and respect. And a man who has been with her through this gothic chapter, who's the only person she wants to be with in the next phase of her life. Now, it may come as a surprise to you, who may not have read any gothic novels, but Gothic novels do not end in tragedy, fairly unique in her ending either. The hero is either saved or saves the day, the villain is either killed or befalls some sort of tragedy, and the protagonists are able to get married and to move on. There is a definite need to moralize and to justify the kind of story that she's just told usually by, by some sort of prose at the end of the book where it says something along the lines of everyone gets what they deserve if they do what's right or if they do what's wrong, bad stuff will happen to you. So Austin somewhat parodies it a little bit where after Tilney reestablishes his relationship with the general and gets his permission more or less, it says, on the strength of this, the general soon after Eleanor's marriage, which happens as well, by the way, permitted his son to return to Northanger and thence made him the bearer of his consent. 
very courteously worded in a page full of empty professions to Mr. Morland. The event, which authorized, soon followed. Henry and Catherine were married. The bells rang and everybody smiled. And as this took place within a twelfth month from the first day of their meeting, it will not appear, after all the dreadful delays occasioned by the general's cruelty, that they were essentially hurt by it. I leave it to be settled whether the tendency of this story be to recommend parental tyranny or reward filial disobedience. Now, Kilgore has some reasoning behind this sort of gothic ending as well, saying that the gothic appears to suggest that the inevitable can only be pleasurably and fictitiously deferred for a time, as the domestic sphere is the only appropriate end of a woman's adventures. Whether the reader be the heroine or the reader herself, who, the thrilling adventure of reading over, closes the book and returns to her daily duties. The gothic thus both represents in the story of its heroine and offers to its readers a momentary subversion of order that is followed by the restoration of a norm which, after the experience of terror, now seems immensely desirable. Henry and Catherine are able to marry and to move on past the gothic and past Northanger and into the future and the new chapters ahead. The end. If you're looking to experience a little bit of the gothic yourself this year, turns out you're in luck. Most of these works, especially those by Radcliffe, Austin, or any of the other key gothic novelists, are in the public domain. You know, they're old enough that they are for free. You can read them online or at your public library, or you can even find an audiobook or two on websites like LibriVox or even on YouTube, totally for free, and read by volunteers who do it for the love of it. It's a really great way to dig into a piece of literature that you otherwise wouldn't have touched, or that seemed a little daunting or scary to even begin. Audiobooks, I completely recommend them, and I totally consider listening to one, reading, fight me. But yeah, why not lose yourself in the gothic a little bit this spooky season and have a wonderful and safe holiday. I'll see you next time. Bye.